The Gospel of Mark is a highly significant literary work that has attracted a correspondingly large amount of attention. But there is very little of what we would now call metadata available for it, that is, data about the origin of the Gospel of Mark that is not derived from what's in it. This is familiar country for the study of early Christianity, but Mark is a particular example that has spawned a range of theories about its genesis. Everybody who comes to this subject, be they Christian, secular or anti-Christian, brings to it a starting position, ideally a completely open mind about what may or may not have happened, but as we all know, you should be so lucky. Those starting positions are broadly the Christian view that Mark was written by John Mark, companion and interpreter of the disciple Peter. Secular Christendom's position that we don't know who wrote it, but tends towards face value interpretation of ancient sources and the anti-Christian position that's also agnostic about the authorship of Mark, but more readily ascribes base motives to early Christian writers. After the starting position someone takes, a second matter is the evidentiary threshold that they require before changing their position. And this threshold varies from generally being quite low for non-scholars, and particularly for sensationalists, to being higher for scholars. Scholars use a high evidentiary threshold because of the environment in which they work. Anything they publish has to get past referees and editors in the same field who are anxious to maintain the reputation of the journals that they manage and are not above professional rivalry. We all know that the evidentiary threshold people use to confirm their existing beliefs is far lower than that used to change them, so if scholars want to convince anyone, what they say must either be prevailing wisdom or else well argued and supported from the evidence. But there is something else that's particular to certain academic disciplines like ancient history, New Testament studies and, for example, sociology. Imagine you're a sociology student. On your first day at university you hear a highly convincing lecture peppered with quotes from the evidence that makes the case that publicly funded education improves economic productivity. The next day you hear a lecture that proves equally convincingly that publicly funded education cripples productivity. So you find from the very beginning of your university career that some theories at least can sound convincing and yet be false. You quickly learn that theories are not judged by how convincing they sound when treated in isolation, but on how they compare with other theories at explaining the evidence. Concocting theories that sound convincing in isolation is what politicians and conspiracy theorists do. Concocting theories that compete with others proposed is what scholars do. Theories compete on matters of simplicity, how much of the evidence they explain, how much of the evidence has to be dismissed as unreliable in order to fit the theory, and perhaps most importantly, how the theory fits in with what we know more generally about the matter in hand. Populists are inclined to judge theories on how convincing they sound internally, without making direct comparisons between different theories that explain the evidence. Also, of course, populism is much more drawn to sensationalism than is scholarship. To now the sources on the authorship of Mark. These are all early Christian writers, and several of them attest to the same story. But note that of the 27 books of the New Testament, Early Christians were wrong about the authorship of 20 out of 27, at least according to modern secular scholarship. Further, there is good reason to suppose that this story of the authorship of Mark started not with Mark, but with an unreliable witness writing around the turn of the 2nd century, i.e. Papias. Papias was Bishop of Hierapolis in the Roman province of Asia, he wrote Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord, a five-volume work which has not survived, but a few passages were quoted by later church fathers, particularly Eusebius, who incidentally thought Papias a man of very little intelligence, because he, Papias, expected a paradise on earth following the second coming of Christ. And incidentally, we also know that Edward Gibbon of Decline and Fall took a pretty dim view of Eusebius as a historian, with good reason. So not the most credible line of transmission. Anyway, we do not know exactly when Papias completed his exposition, but it was between about 100 and 130 AD. Here is Eusebius writing in the early 4th century about Papias. There are said to be five books of Papias which bear the title Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord. Irenaeus also makes mention of these as the only works written by him, saying, 
These things are attested to by Papias, who was John's hearer and an associate of Polycarp, an early writer who mentions them in the fourth book of his works, for he has written a work in five books. So far Irenaeus, but Papias himself, in the preface to his discourses, by no means assert that he was a hearer or an eyewitness of the holy apostles, but tells us that he received the doctrines of faith from their close friends, saying, But I shall not regret to add to my interpretations, also for your benefit, everything I have at any time accurately found out and saved in my memory, as I received it from the elders and recorded it in order to give additional confirmation to the truth by my testimony. For I have never, like many, delighted to hear those with much to say, but those that teach the truth, neither those that record foreign precepts, but those that are given from the Lord to our faith and that came from the truth itself. If I met with anyone who had been a follower of the elders, I made it a point to inquire what the elders had said, what was said by Andrew, Peter or Philip, what by Thomas, James, John, Matthew or any of the other disciples of our Lord, what was said by Ariston and the presbyter John, disciples of the Lord. For I do not think that I derive so much benefit from books as from the voices of those still living. So here Papius gives us the provenance of his information, which is Jesus to the disciples, to the elders, to the elders' followers, to Papius, to Eusebius, to us. Following on from this passage, Eusebius tells us what Papius said of the origins of Matthew and Mark. To the traditions of the presbyter John, we shall now add the extracts from a tradition Papius writes of concerning Mark, who wrote the Gospel. He says, And John the presbyter also said this, Mark, being the interpreter of Peter, whatsoever he recorded, he wrote with great accuracy, but not, however, in the order in which it was spoken or done by our Lord. For he neither heard nor followed our Lord, but was in company with Peter, who gave him such instruction as was necessary, but not a history of our Lord's sayings. Therefore Mark has not erred by writing some things as he has recorded them, for he was attentive to one thing, not to omit anything that he heard, or to state anything falsely. Such is the account of Papias respecting Mark. Of Matthew he stated this, Matthew composed his sayings in the Hebrew dialect, and every one translated it as he was able. There is good reason to suppose that Papias wasn't talking about the Matthew and Mark that we know today. In the case of Matthew, he says the Gospel was written in Hebrew, but the Matthew that we have today we know to have been written in Greek, and we're pretty confident about that. Further, he seems to be implying that the Matthew he's familiar with comprises a list of Jesus' sayings, whereas the Matthew that we know, while it does contain sayings of Jesus, is mainly a narrative of his ministry and passion, rather than a list of sayings. In the case of Mark, Papias refers to the work as being comprehensive, in that the author missed nothing out, and disorganised. And that's not at all the way we would describe the Mark that we know, which is succinct, well-organised and with a high density of meaning per page. These issues are sufficient for me to side with the camp who believes that Papias was not describing the Matthew and Mark that we know. In another passage, Eusebius focuses on the Gospel of Mark rather than focusing on Papias. The Gospel according to Mark. So greatly did the splendour of piety enlighten the minds of Peter's hearers that it was not sufficient to hear but once, nor to receive the unwritten doctrine of the Gospel of God, but they persevered in every variety of entreaties to solicit Mark as the companion of Peter, and whose Gospel we have, that he should leave them a monument of the doctrine thus orally communicated in writing. Nor did they cease their solicitations until they had prevailed with the man, and thus became the means of the history which is called the Gospel according to Mark. They say also that the Apostle Peter, having ascertained what was done by the revelation of the Spirit, was delighted with the zealous ardour expressed by these men, and that the history obtained his authority for the purposes of being read in the churches. This account is given by Clement in the sixth book of his institutions, whose testimony is corroborated also by that of Papias, Bishop of Hierapolis. But Peter makes mention of Mark in the first epistle, which he is also said to have composed at the same city of Rome, and that he shows this fact by calling that city by an unusual trope, Babylon. Thus, the church at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you as also my son Mark. 1 Peter verse 13. 
So we've got Eusebius quoting both Papias and Clement of Alexander giving the same story of the authorship of Mark. But he also quotes Origen. In the first book of his, that is Origen's, commentary on the Gospel of Matthew following the ecclesiastical canon, he attests that he knows of only four Gospels as follows. As I have understood from tradition, respecting the four Gospels, which are the only undisputed ones in the whole Church of God throughout the world, the first is written according to Matthew, the same that was once a publican but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, who, having published it for the Jewish converts, wrote it in Hebrew. The second is according to Mark, who composed it, as Peter explained to him, whom he also acknowledges as his son in his general epistle, saying, The elect church in Babylon salutes you, as also Mark, my son. And the third according to Luke, the gospel commended by Paul, which was written for the converts from the Gentiles. And last of all, the gospel according to John. I'll mention just a couple more sources. Justin Martyr in Dialogue with Trypho, dating from around 160 AD. It is said that he changed the name of one of the apostles to Peter, and when it is written in the memoirs of him that this so happened, as well as that he changed the names of two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, to Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, in that little snippet Justin doesn't mention Mark directly, but mentions memoirs of him, where him could be Peter or Jesus. But Mark is the only book that uses the phrase Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, and uses just the same wording. So this can be used to support Papias's statement that Mark recorded what he learned from Peter, if, that is, Justin Martyr is referring to the memoirs of Peter and he's quoting details only found in Mark. We've seen above Origen associating the four Gospels with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but the first person to make this association where we can be confident they are talking about the same Gospels that we have now was Irenaeus, writing in Against Heresies in 180 AD. And he says, quotes, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, also delivered to us in writing the things that were then being preached by Peter. I know this is getting dull, but there's a couple of final sources worth considering, and they are the Gospel prologues. There are two sets of Latin prologues that appear in early Latin manuscripts of the Gospels. The earliest set are the anti marcionite prologues, and they are incomplete in that we have one for all Gospels except for Matthew. These date from around 200 AD. The other set are known as the Monarchian prologues, after the Monarchians who believed God the Father and Jesus to be the same thing. We have one of these for each of the Gospels, and they date from the 4th or 5th century. Here is the earlier anti marcionite prologue for Mark. Mark made his assertion who was named Stubby because his fingers were short in proportion to the rest of his body. This student and interpreter of Peter followed him just as he had heard Peter report. At the request of the brethren in Rome, he wrote this short proclamation in Italy. When Peter heard this, he approved its reading of the church with his own authority, the truth of the gospel which he himself had compiled. After the departure of Peter, he went away into Egypt, and was ordained the first bishop of Alexandria, announced Christ there himself. He placed there a church, so that all the followers of the doctrine of Christ and of the life of such self-restraint was to imitate its example. It is of note that whoever wrote this was likely aware of Papias, because Papias is mentioned by name in the anti marcionite prologue for the Gospel of John. The later Monarchian prologue for Mark begins, Mark, the evangelist of God and in the divine word and son of the disciple Peter in baptism, a Levite according to the flesh in the priesthood of Israel, he was converted to the faith of Christ. He wrote his gospel in Italy, showing in it what he owed to his own and to Christ and to our nation. I apologise that ancient sources don't make for the most riveting reading, but you get the picture. Papias is our earliest source, probably writing in the early 2nd century, and he says Mark was an associate of the Apostle Peter. But he has questionable reliability, and it's uncertain whether he was talking about the Gospel of Mark that we now have. Further, his words were selected and passed on to us by Eusebius, not the best historian. <laughs> 
Then there are other, later ancient sources that attest to the same story who may or may not have got it directly or indirectly from Papias. Justin Martyr around 160 AD tells us that the memoirs of him, him possibly being Peter, mention the sons of Zebedee being renamed Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, a line that is only found in Mark's Gospel, and none of the others. Justin Martyr quotes from all four Gospels, but he doesn't give any of them the names that we're familiar with. Then 20 years later, around 180 AD, Irenaeus does identify the four Gospels with the names that we recognise. So something seems to have happened between about 160 and 180 AD. Maybe a proliferation of Gospels at this time made it essential to name them so that believers could follow who was being quoted, and these were simply the names that shook out. Or perhaps a codex appeared that contained multiple Gospels that were differently named in order to distinguish them, or perhaps something else happened. At the Christian apologetic or conservative historicist end of the spectrum, Papias was early and reliable, and his story is attested by several independent witnesses. At the sceptical or mythicist end of the spectrum, Papias was late and unreliable, either because he's confused or is talking about text other than the ones that we know, and he's not independently corroborated because other early Christians got their ideas from him, and we just don't know who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So the situation is ambiguous enough that the conclusions you reach probably depend more on your own psychology than on the evidence. Some use the evidence to rationalise their existing beliefs, and some change their beliefs to fit the evidence. Sound familiar? It's a bit like the Gospels themselves, which are either early, reliable and independently attesting to the life of Jesus, or late, unreliable and dependent on each other. You see, scholarship is easy. You simply pick your position, plug in the sources, turn the handle, and out comes the paper, PhD thesis, or pot boiler. But you do pick your own position. You don't let me or anyone else pick it for you. That would spoil the fun.